Well, we have, as you, if you don't like that format, box, we have other sounds which are of that form. Uh, but again, it's kind of bad. Let's talk about it. Alrighty, should we get started? So uh, Thomas is going to continue to tell us some very cool arithmetic things. And um, yeah, so the work I'm going to talk about is uh, mostly based on a paper with David Spire. Uh, let me start uh, with a bit of motivation, um, uh, which is uh, often, often um, in the setting of this uh, semester, we um, we're interested in integrals that look a little bit like this. So we take x as a cluster variety, and then we have this natural top form on polymorphic, well, neuromorphic top form on the cluster variety product. Um, and this guy, we just take one cluster, and we take the wedge of all the d logs of the cluster variables in that. And then we do, and then there's a little bit of other things. And, and uh, somehow, we must put something here. Like if we just do this, this integral does a conversion. Um, uh, I mean, so x greater than zero is actually a very simple to understand thing. It's just uh, r greater than zero to the dimension of this uh, uh, cluster variety. Um, so, uh, this, um, so we do need something here, and there are a few cases where, um, uh, uh, well, well, you might see something here. So, uh, um, in Sebastian's talk, um, he talks about uh, m zero n. That is uh, not exactly in the setting that I'll talk about, but um, in that case, you put sort of this, this something here. This something here looks like um, uh, product of some rational functions um, on the cluster variety to some additional other parameters, um, so the uh, uh, sij or something like that. Uh, so we get these uh, string amplitudes. Um, and um, I don't know if Nima will talk about it, but there, there's another setting where we put a, a, a massive delta function here. So uh, it's sort of delta to some big number um, or something. Um, and you get uh, uh, super, uh, things related to super Yang Um and, and in that case, it's, it's um, in that case, it's a little bit cheating because I'm thinking about the tree level guy, and you don't really need to write a contour here. It's just a residue. And um, so there's another setting that uh, might be less familiar to this audience. Um, uh, um, you can write e to some kind of regular function. So e to something that belongs to a cluster algebra. Um, and 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 this regular function um, uh, is when we think of this. Uh, um, cluster variety as a Langard uh, Ginsberg model, which is uh, mirror to something else. Um, so sometimes, sometimes if this x is a, um, 
uh, x is a um, LG model, uh, um, then, uh, then it comes with uh, x comma f. And it comes with some other regular function, and we, we want to write the integral, we want to write this integral with the same form, but e to the f in that case. And, and the, the f will correspond to so somehow the boundary structure of the, um, of the mirror dual uh, classifier. <coughs> So as Sebastian exchange, uh, explained in his talks, when you're interested in, when you write down a class of integrals of this type and you say what kind of uh, integrand you put, um, you get a space of integrals, so it's not, often not just a single integral, but you get a space of them, and to, uh, to, find, to understand the dimension of the space, you have to understand some kind of cohomology groups. Um, so that's, that's one motivation to understand the topology of a cluster variety. Okay, so, uh, let me get down to uh, some, so let me write down some um, uh, notation first. So the kind of cluster algebras I'll look at, so A is going to be a cluster algebra, is going to be associated to a B tilde matrix, a uh, standard exchange matrix, and the only, the only kind that I'll look at are called cluster algebras, um, uh, which are skew symmetric and off geometric type. So that's a lot of jargon. What does that mean? So that this means B tilde is a, an integer matrix. Um, it's uh, like it's got uh, n columns and n plus m rows. And the top part is B. Um, and B is skew symmetric. And we associate to uh, um, uh, associated to this, well, I'll draw a quiver, and the quiver only, I'm only going to have mutable uh, vertices in the quiver, so my quiver will only know the top half of my matrix. So, um, so EG, uh, if, if Q is this, um, uh, if Q is this guy, then, then the B matrix um, looks something like this. So there, if there's a, an arrow from i to j, then I, um, uh, there's an arrow from i to j if and only if b i j is, is positive. And I won't, um, I won't have need to put uh, multiplicity on my edges. So I'll, I'll, I'll just have a directed, my quivers will be directed graphs. Um, and I, I don't need multiple edges. So, so you don't have multiple edges? Or you... I do not need multiple edges. So somehow the invariants that I would define do not depend on the on the number of edges. So so that means that you I can assume that your uh, matrix is zero one matrix. Right? Yes. Or, or one. But also well actually uh, let me just uh, well, you give me an integer skew symmetric integer matrix and I will give you a Q and that loses information. Let's think about it. So any integer matrix skew symmetric integer matrix. For this construction. So I think Lauren already explained in this morning how to go from uh, such a picture or such a matrix to a, to a ring, uh, a cluster algebra. And um, and let me mention a few adjectives that I'll make. So um, I'll call the, cl the cluster algebra full rank um, if uh, the rank of B tilde is equal to n, that's the biggest possible we could have, and uh, really full rank. Um, if the columns, sorry, the rows of the tilde span uh, z to the n, so uh, full rank in the integral sense, um, I'll call it acyclic. And this, uh, right, so acyclic if q, um, if q has no oriented cycles. Um, so let me say that the first two things are preserved under mutation. This one is not preserved under mutation. So I, I would say a cluster is acyclic if this is true, and but then the cluster algebra is acyclic if it is true for one of the one of the clusters. Um, and then I need an adjective which I'm not going to fully define. But it's not a long um, definition, so it's called Louise if it's covered by covered by um, acyclic. Um, and uh, this, this adjective includes uh, uh, probably all the, uh, all the cluster algebras that you um, encounter in nature. So, uh, Grossmannians, uh, positroids, 
um, includes acyclic things, so it particularly includes finite type, ADE, um, there, Luis, uh, um, and uh, triangulable surfaces, so like, Lauren explained what, what, what cross algebras they are, the ones coming from surfaces, so they're also Luis. So what does it mean covered? Uh, sorry? What does it mean covered? Yeah, exactly. So I'm not. Uh, oh, my oh, point yeah. is, I'm not telling you what it means, but I'm saying <laughs> I'm giving you a list of examples of things that have this property. And it is not. So this is a definition that only depends on Q. So Q Q is either satisfies this condition or not, and it's a combinatorial condition. It's not too long to give, but I'm never going to use that condition. So I, I'm never I'm never going to have need to check that condition on something. So I'm just going to. Um, so what is it called? Means? That's a long story. I think that came from maybe, Lake, maybe Louise at Banff. Huh? Lake Louise at Banff. Ah, okay. So it's not named after a person, but after a lake. Presumably, Lake, lake Louise is named after a person. <laughs> <laughs> you might not named after a mathematician, and that I says a lot about you, Alex. <laughs> no, I think it was Greg Mueller who came up with condition. Greg uh, Mueller. Uh, Greg Miller came up with the word bench, and we thought we came up with something better, so we thought it would be that's, that's an argument. Um, okay, so, uh, so what's the problem is you give me a B matrix, um, uh, so you, the input is B tilde, and, and now I want to know what is this. Uh, and my definition, my definition of X is X. Um, so I'm going to use some languages which is, may not be familiar to everyone here, but you know, that's, that's my definition. Um, and as I said, my, uh, my conventions for cluster algebras are um, frozen variables are inverted inside the ring, the inverses live in the ring, but uh, mutable variables, uh, the inverses are, are not part of the generators. So but this has, it's got all the xi which is mutable, and then it has like xj, xj inverse for the frozen. Okay. okay, so uh, under these situations, in the situations that we're going to uh, be looking at, um, this uh, um, this guy uh, this guy will be smooth. And um, to calculate this thing is an algebraic problem. What I mean is that. Um, uh, we don't really need to think about, uh, so what is this we're supposed to look at? Uh, differential forms on x. But we actually don't need to look at um, real smooth differential forms. We can actually just look at algebraic forms. So um, and this is a, a basic uh, result of gravity. Um, but in general, it's not smooth. In general? Yeah. What, what's it? Not for any matrix B tilde. So, so, so I need, yeah, okay, let's say B tilde is Louise plus plus full rank. So under under these conditions, um, um, we can write down um, the following um, sequence. Uh, D is the dimension, I say. Um, and uh, and what is what is one of uh, what is an element in one of these uh, one of these spaces? Um, this uh, so omega. Omega k uh, of x looks uh, contains elements that look like um, some of uh, like uh, so something that looks like this. So it looks like it, it looked. It just is a formal symbol, which is sum over some polynomials that are inside my ring, uh, times a wedge of d of a bunch of things which are also inside my ring. And and when I apply d, I just formally apply d like like, like this. That's it. Okay. And and so then um, uh, in the setting in the setting here. Uh, um, so so the point here is that the, everything here is polynomial. Like no, uh, I mean. We don't we don't need to work with any um, any transcendental stuff, um, and and um, so 
the, 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 um, the cohomology groups are just this um, uh, kernel divided by image. So we already saw this thing. It's the best thing. <clears throat> okay, so that's uh, uh, to every cluster algebra. Um, you just this is just something that's associated to it. Um, okay, and now let me talk about the, um, the arithmetic. And uh, and the first thing is that we can um, uh, this. Uh, this x guy uh, is defined by a bunch of exchange routes. So it's got a lot of uh, it's a lot got a lot of cluster variables and it's, uh, and there's also a collection of uh, mutation exchange relations. And those exchange relations um, have integer coefficients. So this guy is defined um, over the integers. Um, and I can take I can think of the whole thing as defined over um, um, over some uh, finite field f q. So here is some. So if you're not familiar with an FQ, where Q is a power of a prime, just think of F. It's already, it's already fun to just think about FP, which is, which is just modular arithmetic um, mod P for prime. Um, so what? Uh, um, so I'm going to give some. I'm going to do a lot of examples. Most, nearly the whole talk is on examples. So uh, let me formulate. Um, and, and here, let's just let me just um, when I say arithmetic, let me kind of be uh, naive and just ask. Um, let's study this function. Um, so it depends on a prime, well, uh, sorry, a prime power q, and um, uh, and a B tutor matrix. So I'm going to look at the number of points of x over this um, finite field, and I'm going to think of this as a function that takes as input. Uh, Prime power and gives us output this uh, integer, um, and it's, it depends on this uh, um, depends on my cluster variety x. So, so the only thing it depends on is this B tilde matrix. Okay, um, and so let me uh, let me form my, uh, a theorem that's easy to state here, and then and then just do uh, a bunch of examples. So, theorem says that if x is Louis plus uh, really full rank. Um, then uh, Px is a polynomial. Uh, so if x is Louis plus, but it's only full rank, um, then it's uh, then it's not a there's not always a polynomial, um, but it's uh, Px. Of Q is equal to so something <coughs> in the ring generated by uh, Dirichlet characters um, for large P. So this 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 guy has some bad behavior at some low primes uh, when the B tilde matrix is not integrally full rank. But if when it's integrally full rank, it, it doesn't have any bad behavior. So you may not know what this word means, but we'll see some of these functions in a, in a while. So question: so, so if you fix P, uh, will it and say that Q powers of G and fix prime? Yes. Will it be a polynomial in uh, these powers? <coughs> um. Uh. Not not necessarily not necessarily. Yeah, so it's, it's more complicated than even if you restrict it. Yeah, so let me let me do the basic example where we can already see both uh, both how these things are interesting even for the easiest case, which is actually the case in my first lecture, uh, the three by three matrix case. Um, let's take this uh, uh, A one cluster algebra, which is this B two the matrix. Um, so what is uh, what is so this is a this is a two dimensional guy which is one one dimension smaller than the uh, than the space I had in, in my three by three matrix example. Um, what is this guy? So this this guy uh, set has uh, this is an A one um, cluster algebra with one uh, well, it's called principal coefficients. Um, so it's got one ex one exchange relation and there are three variables x x prime and an additional variable y. Um, <laughs> And uh, the the conventions are that um, 
Uh, we need to we need to look at triples. Um, we need to look at triples x x prime and y that satisfy this equation um, with the condition that um, uh, y has to be non-zero. So, so x and x prime can be zero, but the y cannot be because that guy's frozen. So let, let us let's count how many solutions there are to the equation. So as I said, if you don't know what FQ is, we're just doing modular arithmetic mod P. You can take Q to be P and, and let's see how many solutions there are to this equation. So uh, so there are three, so we expect this to be uh, roughly quadratic because there are three things which three parameters in one equation. Okay. So let's count this. Um, so to count this we have it's already slightly interesting because you have to divide into two cases. Y is uh, uh, y is not in the minus one, or y is one. So if y is <coughs> um, y is not equal to minus one mod p or whatever uh, inside your field, um, uh, then then x can be any. Uh, uh, then the right hand side is non-zero. Um, x can be anything non-zero, and x prime will be determined by it. So then then x is uh, inside here, um, and then x prime is equal to one plus y over x. Okay, so so how many choices are there of this? So um, uh, to, you, to choose y is not equal to minus one, um, and we already know y is not zero, so the number of choices for y is q minus two. Can you and uh, uh, and for whatever choice of y, you still have q minus one choices for x. And then x prime is uniquely determined the other one. So this is the this is the answer in the first case. But what if uh, if y is equal to minus one inside f q, then now uh, then what are our choices? So then then we have uh, we have um, x x prime is equal to zero. So then we have either so we have x is equal to zero, and y and x prime can be anything. Um, uh, so yeah. <coughs> Or we can have x is anything, and then x prime is zero. Um, but then these overlap on the case where x is zero and x prime is zero. So the number of choices here is it's uh, here the counting is two q, but it also counted by one. So I get two q. Do I got this right? And the total uh, is, uh, is this this number plus this number. Q squared two plus two q minus one, which is q squared minus two plus one. So, 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 yes. Q is not equal to two, or it's true like even if we have two. The formula is still, I believe, the formula is still true when q is equal to two. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, when q is equal to 2, then actually no points of this form. Um, uh, right, then you know 0 things should be equal to minus 1. Uh, yeah, perfect. Yes. 2 is equal to 2. Uh, I think it should be still be OK. I'm a little bit. Uh, so, so if Q is a power of two, I'm still okay. Um, yeah, I, I think I think the, the form the form still works, but it, it looks a bit weird, but it still works. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, so let let me contrast this. Uh, let me contrast this to the case where we take where. So this guy is this guy is full rank, um, and uh, in fact, it's really full rank. And let me contrast this to the case where, um, where B tilde matrix is zero M. So, so this this is the same. This is the same kind of problem. as X. There's one. There's three uh, variables. One equation, which is now X prime. What did you say? Really full rank means. Uh, really, really full rank means that the rows of this matrix span <coughs> Z to the N. In this case, oh, oh, it just okay, means okay, okay. one is a generator of Z. Okay. Uh, if m is greater than one, it is not. If m is not one or minus one, this is not uh, correct. 
Okay, so so now we have this thing, let's say, and and but then the rules are the same. X x and x prime are arbitrary, but y has to be non-zero. Um, so uh, so now okay, again we split into two cases, but now there are more solutions to this equation. So um, in fact, how many how many solutions are there? The equation y to the m in equal minus one has the following number of solutions, which you can confirm for yourself. So is the GCD of um, You do so. We, we can do the same counting that goes along with here, but which, which somehow the counting is the same once you know whether y to the m is uh, whether the right hand side is zero or not. Um, the answer the answer turns into uh, two squared plus this. So so the function that we're looking for is the function that sets a prime power q to this expression. Um, and uh, just for fun, let's uh, have a, take a closer look at the case m equals three, where um, where you you're, you want to cut solutions to this thing. So it turns out that in this case, c, which is the number of solutions to this equation, um, is equal to one of three, um, depending if this p is congruent to two mod three. Of p is coming to one mod three. So, uh, so for example, for example, if you work mod five, um, uh, if you work mod five, then um, uh, then it's good. then you're in the first case, and there are two solutions to there are two solutions to uh, y cube y cube equals to minus one mod five. Sorry, there's one solution, and the only solution is y is four. Y is minus one. Um, I mean, the options are y is equal to zero, which doesn't work. Y is one, which doesn't work. Y is two, which is eight, which is not minus one. And then y is three, also doesn't work. Um, and, but then if you do p equals seven, then y could be minus one mod seven. So the solutions are, uh, are three, four, and six. So there are three solutions. Three cubed, four cubed, and six cubed are all minus one. Um, there, there's a short, in some sense, there's a short way to write this, which is kind of a little bit relevant for what happens later on. Is that this thing, this thing here, c minus two, this thing uh, is also equal to this Legendre symbol minus three over. So, so in general case, so when it's not a polynomial, will it be but just oh, like in the second case, it's just full rack? Will it be just always finite number of cases? When it's polynomial? Uh, y yes, because um, so in the, in the ring generated by uh, Dirichlet characters, and each Dirichlet character is periodic with some particular period. Mm -hmm. um, so because it's in the ring generated by these things, um, there are only finitely many Dirichlet characters you need to write the formula, and those Dirichlet characters have a common um, common uh, lowest common multiple. So. So, yeah. well, so they are finite. Yes, yeah. they are. You can write a formula for every case, but yeah. So yeah, it's quasi polynomial. It's called, Sorry, it's called I think quasi polynomial. Um, Something that's just given by several cases. It's, right. So I, I think I think this statement is is sharper than than that. Yeah. Okay. What about for large? P? So so the yeah so <laughs> this this large p part happens because of the following issue is that um uh, this this guy x over complexes under the assumptions that I said. So this is a smooth complex. It's a complex manifold. But when you base change to over um, FQ, it turns out that it can have singularities for small primes, in which case this analysis doesn't, uh, is not so good. Um, but but for, for large primes, it's going to be smooth. Um, basically, you need the prime to be uh, bigger. So something weird happens here if M is three or less, basically. So if, um, if you, you're not uh, if you're not really full rank, then um, then uh, you 
you have some abelian group, which is the quotient of the lattice divided by the image of this matrix. Um, and, and that group will contain sort of uh, the, the, the prime with its bad, bad behavior. So the, uh, the torsion in that group. <coughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, okay, so, so this is the kind of behavior you generally expect, and, and that's what the theorem is saying. So if, if it's really full rank, if the V-matrix is really full rank, you just get an honest polynomial. Otherwise, you get something that looks kind of like this, but a more complicated formula. Um, okay, so let me, um, before I go on to cohomology and explain why this calculation is related to cohomology, um, let me just present one of the kind of things that we know about the general formula for point count is the following theorem, um, which is that if Q is uh, acyclic, uh, if B tilde is acyclic, um, so it's, if, for example, if the quiver is a tree, and also it's really full rank, then there's an explicit combinatorial formula for, for what this point count gives you. So then P, Q, So it's equal to the following polynomial. Um, n plus m is the total num is, is the um, number of rows in the B matrix. That's the dimension of the cluster variety. K varies from 0 to something. Um, uh, and then, uh, so this formula. And here, AK is the number of independent subsets, subsets in Q. Uh, um, of size k. Um, so when I say independent subsets, I'm ignoring the orientation on the edges. And independent subsets just means a subset of the vertices that are not adjacent. Um, so example, oh crap, that, that's the uh, one. That being recorded too. Um, this is that was q squared minus q plus one. Um, uh, so, so in uh, so this formula, uh, uh, when when b tilde is equal to zero one, um, q is just uh, a single vertex, and the possible uh, the possible choices for um, for k uh, an independent subset is either you take no vertices, so. So you take k equals 0, then you can take no vertices, or k equals 1, and you can just take this vertex. And because there are no edges, any subset is um, uh, so any subset is independent. So independent means that the vertices can't be adjacent. Um, um, and then you write down q minus, so this gives you, this contributes q minus 1 squared, um, and this contributes q minus, sorry, this contributes q. And you can see that q minus 1 squared plus q is this number that we calculated by hand. Um, any questions? So, so, it's just, well, so you said you always assume that x is full rank, at least. Yes. But like in previous example, for example, if m equals to 0, then it's not full rank. Uh, but it's still a polynomial, I guess, if m equals to zero. Yeah, if m equals uh, is it, is it, is it if, yeah, if m equals zero, it's it's in this case, it, it's you can still do it, and it's kind of dumb. But when when it's not full rank, you get you can potentially get some really bad behavior. So if if, if m is so if m is equal to zero, the equation is x x prime is equal to one plus one, and separately you have a y that can be so so then you get q minus one choices of this, and then. You, Depending on whether p is two or not two, whether p is two or not, you either get uh, if, if p is not two, then you just pick x to be non-zero and x prime is determined by it. Mm -hmm. So it, you can also do it and it's fine, uh, but it actually doesn't fit. It doesn't fit into the setting. It, it does, this does not give the right answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me move on to. Uh, uh, so, so this was somehow um, the point pack is the more elementary of the two questions. So that's why I did the point pack first. Um, and now let's let's look at topology, and I'll, I'll do the same thing. Um, 
So we start with this uh, equivalent matrix uh, again, and, and now x x prime is equal to one plus y. Um, and now I think of this as so. This is uh, this is something that's sitting inside uh, C three. Um, x and x prime are arbitrary. Y but y has to be y has to be uh, non-zero. Um, and I'm looking at the two two complex dimensional, which means um, four real dimensional um, uh, uh, subset of this um, a subset of this six dimensional space um, that satisfies this equation. So this is either a complex two manifold or real four manifold. And and the question is what is what is the uh, what is the topology of this thing? So. Uh, this, this is probably not immediately recognizable, but um, here's, here's one thing you can do to calculate uh, what topology of this is. Um, I claim that this, uh, this space, this four manifold, can, you can deformation retract it, uh, retract um, to the subset of it, um, which is two dimensions, to, uh, to the subspace where. Um, Actually, the uh, absolute values of these two complex numbers are equal, um, and also uh, so that gives one one condition, and also the uh, y is equal to absolute value of y is equal to one. So that that's a claim, um, and so this is a two manifold that is sitting inside. Actually, it's not a manifold, but this is a two dimensional subspace sitting inside this four space. Uh, let me try to draw. Let me try to draw this two-dimensional thing. So, um, this two-dimensional thing. Now, uh, this guy here is just a circle. Um, the, the locus where uh, that's just a phase. Um, so you get a circle. Um, but then um, you can think of this guy as fibered over the circle. But the fiber depends on whether y is minus one or not minus one. So if y is not minus one. Y is a phase that's not minus one. Then there's going to be a circle sitting about. This will give me a circle. If y is minus one, then um, both of these have to equal to zero. So that's just a point. Um, so in this case, it looks like it actually looks like this. Uh -huh. That's what the space looks like. So um, so the y coordinate is here, and if you're if, and here is when y is equal to y is equal to minus one. Um, when y is not equal to minus one, you get a little circle in the axis. But when y is equal to minus one, it's pinched. And this guy, uh, the Betty table for this guy is uh, um, so 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 the, the two-dimensional torus has Betty numbers one, two, and one. This guy, you pinch one of the cycles, so you reduce x one by one. So this guy is, and. Um, and you should think of this one 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 as these coefficients one one one, except with minus one to the i. One. That's how we're supposed to match it to the point match. Oh, it's not always this easy. <coughs> yes. So, so question about the previous theorem. So, does it imply that these numbers a k are invariants of Weber? Yeah. Though, no, though, no. sadly, set. We were really happy when we found this. We thought, oh, we find a really cool um, mutation invariant of quivers, which is like number. But it turns out that uh, uh, if you have an acyclic cluster algebra, any two acyclic seeds are related by source and sink uh, reversals. So actually, if you have an acyclic cluster algebra, then there's only there's you you only get one guy that does this. But all the other seeds will not be acyclic. So you only get to compute this in one seed. So. I see. Yeah. So it's really not, this is not, not that for us. Yeah. So it's not. Uh, I mean, it is an invariant, but we can only compute it in one place. Okay. <laughs> I mean, after reversing the uh, uh, sink and source reversals. Um, okay. So uh, if U tilde is equal to um, uh, this matrix. Uh, then um, you can repeat the same. So, so then you're looking at this equation, um, and, and y is not equal to zero. Um, again, it's a four manifold, etc. But um, and what it does is it deformation retracts to a space that looks like this. So 
So you get a bunch of two spheres that are glued end to end, um, and there's m of them. Um, and uh, if, if there are two, two spheres, then you glue them end to end by gluing them in two places. But if there's only one two sphere, then you glue them like this. And this guy has a Betty table that um, uh, that looks like uh, H2, H1, H2. So, so there's uh, uh, the Betty numbers are 1, 1, and M. So each, each of the two spheres will give you, will contribute one dimension to H2. Okay. And um, you'll notice that this appears to not, uh, not correspond to a point count. For the point count, we got this non-polynomial thing, which was uh, uh, Q squared uh, plus C minus 2 times Q plus 1. Um, and the reason is that this cohomology um, actually can be broken down even further using something called the weight subtraction. Um, which I won't define, but uh, I'll show, um, I want to show you kind of um, some examples how this, uh, how this additional filtration works. Um, <coughs> so, um, what we do is, uh, um, so there's something called a, a mixed hot structure. Um, and, and in this case, what it does is it allows me to um, this m-dimensional, so this this is an m-dimensional vector space H two. Um, it actually breaks this. It actually breaks this m-dimensional vector space into some. Um, actually, naturally splits into some uh, subspaces, and it splits into. And the way you write it is you usually write it like this. So this m-dimensional showed m-dimensional subspace has two pieces. Um, uh, one piece, uh, one, uh, a subspace of one dimension and a subspace of n minus one dimension. It, it's sort of a filtration, but in this case, somehow it, it splits canonically into two, two subspaces. And um, and the way we recover this, uh, recover the polynomial we had previously, is that um, associated to each um, uh, integer, so each uh, subspace here, I have to associate a collection of things called Frobenius eigenvalues. Um, and um, which which have to be calculated, but uh, I'm just telling you the answer in this case. And the Frobenius eigenvalues are one uh, p. The, the Frobenius eigenvalues are also always a phase times uh, power of a prime p. So these Frobenius eigenvalues depend on a prime. And um, in the first row, there will always be just a power of a prime, just like that. But in the second row, in the second row, you will get something um, uh, slightly interesting, and you and you end up with uh, um, something like this for for m equals m equals three. So for, for m equals three, um, each box so the, the the table looks like one 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 two, and I have to associate to each uh, each thing um, uh, a phase times a power of a prime. And the power, the power is kind of easy to figure out. So the, the powers are always um, uh, integer powers of the prime that just corresponds to the degree in cohomology on the first row. And the second row, the power of the prime just drops by one. And on the third row, it drop by, it'll drop by two. So, so the power of the prime is uh, uh, 0, 1, 2 on the first row, and then negative 1, 0, 1 on the second row. Um, but then there's an interesting phase, and, and, and the phase is not, easy, not always easy to figure out. And the total formula is that um, uh, PXQ is equal to, um, what it is is you have to, um, there's a formula in terms of these things, so you take 1 uh, to the power n, so Q is um, A, so if Q is P to the A, uh, then the formula to go from this table to the point back is the following. Uh, you take uh, negative 1 to the i, and you sum all of these things to the power a. So, uh, minus p to the a. And everything here gets a plus sign because it's in degree, but it's in h2. So it's plus p to the 2a plus uh, p to the a, and plus this thing. And, and this is actually equal to uh, what we had before, if you remember the calculation. So, 
Another question. Yes. So, so in the wood case, in this uh, how you call it, fully full rack or totally full rack, yeah. do you expect uh, is there a point correct duality? Um, so these, uh, right, so that, that's actually the main theorem. So these spaces don't have concrete duality in the classical sense because they are not compact. They're, they're smooth but not compact. But uh, the theorem, um, the theorem is it satisfies something called curious uh, Lefschetz duality, which is which is why we say this. So, so the, the, the next theorem has some jargon in it, which hopefully I can. But Betty numbers, like in this good case, are they? Like in your examples, where one no, the, the one, Betty, uh, uh, right? So the, this 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 example where uh, yeah, this example where I get one one one. This is this is an unusual example. So so we don't expect symmetry. We don't ex expect symmetry, but we expect, expect symmetry, which is kind of roll by roll. And I'll, 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 I'll give an example of how this is. So the. I didn't say the values. I have expressed those Euler characteristics. So, uh, so, sorry, can you say? Oh, the, these eigenvalues? Yeah. Um, so, can, can you write these formulas in terms of uh, this chi PQ Euler characteristics? Because in pure case, you, you have this, right? So, you just have Euler characteristics. Uh, so I, I know that yeah I know there is a collection of um, collection of phases that you can write down which will give you the right answer I I, I don't know any interpretation interpretation of this um, but yeah. no I just wondered because the soil characteristic have this uh, how it's called uh, also this properties like uh, addition subtraction property. Right, like so the point count, but, the, but, the, but so so the the point count is the point count has the same property uh -huh. as the Euler characteristic, but the cohomology does not, and somehow the Frobenius eigenvalues are associated to cohomology, not to yeah. So so the Euler characteristic and the point count are well behaved in terms of like you can take yeah. just just yeah inclusion <laughs> exclusion. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so so the theorem is that if x is full rank um, plus satisfies its adjective Louise, then um, uh, so the jargon is that x star uh, x is something called Hodge tape type. Um, and I think people in, in the audience somehow prefer to use the word mixed tape type, right? which I think means exactly the same thing. Uh, um, and all, all that means is that you can write it in a table like this. Um, otherwise, otherwise, I actually need an extra dimension. So if it's not Hodge tape type, my table is, should be even. There's an additional dimension to write. Um, um, so it's Hodge tape type and um, and the um, next Hodge structure is split over Q. Um, what that means, what that means is that I can find a basis of cohomology with these, basically with these eigenvalues. I can find a basis of cohomology for each of these pieces and the forms that I write down. So the forms I write down would be some holomorphic forms on this. Uh, on this class of variety, and the forms I write down, I will only need to use coefficients which are in Q. So I won't need some weird complex numbers when I write down a basis of forms. Um, and then it satisfies uh, something called curious uh, Lefschetz duality. So it does not satisfy usual Poincare duality. Already, uh, already in this example, you can see that it, uh, this. This Betty table is not symmetric around the middle. Um, and also, somehow, in some sense, the middle is here. So. <coughs> okay, um, so, so like going back to this zero one, one thing you can. Uh, so here the Betty numbers are one, one, and one. You can write down a, a, a basis of form. And here it's easy to understand the form. And um, so um, this this form is just uh, y is a non-zero number. So d log y is just a well-defined thing on the whole on the whole cluster variety. So y is frozen, and this guy is uh, is Misch's form. So I call this uh, Gettman Shapiro Weinstein form. So this is the two form, which is uh, cluster variety comes from a uh, distinguished two form, which uh, 
uh, which has a formula that looks like this. Um, uh, so this is like d log x i squared d log x j. So you pick you pick up any cluster you like and you just write down this formula, and that's going to be a two form which turns out to be regular in every cluster. Um, so it, it's um, uh, so so. So it, it has, I mean, it has no singularities on the cluster torus for the initial cluster, just like construction. But somehow, by by calculation, it also works in the neighboring clusters. Okay. And and that's the answer. Th those are the those are the three things, three forms we need for the cohomology of this uh, thing, which is three-dimensional cohomology. Um, so sorry, you don't have d log x. Just uh, <coughs> so because so you're not you're d log not, you're x not, is not right. is not well defined if you mutate once. And also, I mean, these are all so. Also, these are all closed forms, and um, and and every yeah every cohomology class is up to a, a, a total derivative equivalent to one of these things. Um, and so, in this case, uh, so let me contrast this with what happens if you do this oh, one. And just, just the rule. I, I drew this. I drew this sort of ring of two spheres, and um, and uh, and. And using that uh, calculation, you can prove that the, the forms. Uh, you can prove that you get a basis of cohomology by uh, by using the following form. And so now, so now I can explain just sort of uh, intuitively, heuristically, what the rows of this table are. The top row are forms that are d log forms, which means that they are um, sums of wedges of d logs of regular of, of functions on the um, on the variety. Um, which is what this thing, uh, this gamma is, yes, so that's a d log form. But y times gamma, this is a differential form that's not a d log form. It's not d log of anything. Um, and that's why it's sitting on the second row. So, uh, so to get a basis of cohomology in this case, you can't just use uh, d log forms. And, and so the, the, this mixed hot structure is measuring how far from the d log form you are. Uh, maybe not so not completely. Uh, Honest, but but it's sort of at least heuristically is is not too bad. Um, so let me draw some pictures. Yeah. So I so there was there was a statement in this theorem that said that there was a duality. Um, and so I want to draw some bigger value value tables. So. Sorry, I have a stupid question. Why why can't I uh why why aren't all those why aren't all those, why can't I write all of those as uh, uh, all the rest of them as d of something? No, I'm, I'm saying it's not d log of something inside the cluster algorithm. Right, but, but why isn't it? Why can't I write them as? Uh, why, why aren't they all? Uh, oh, so what are they d of? Well, I mean, um, uh, why d of d log x uh, y to some power. Oh, I mean, you're, 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 I thought you're multiplying dx over x, dy over y by like powers of y. Yes, that's so right. So what's wrong with d of dx over x, y to a power? Right. So so this is not a holomorphic form on this. This guy is not. A, a, yeah. But the thing that you want to be a total derivative of also has to be well defined in the classic variety, and this is not. But then what? Then then why is dx over x, dy over y itself okay? Oh, Why are any of them okay with the dx over x there? I think I, I just have a stupid, it's a stupid question. No, no, okay. Yeah. dx over x by itself is never, is never going no, to be but, okay. No, but, 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 but I'm just saying, why is dx over x dy over y okay? But, uh, oh, okay. Okay, I see. All right. Never mind. Fine. Okay, okay so, so, right. I mean, this, this calculation is not obvious, but, yeah. <laughs> It, requir it requires doing this computation. Uh, so let me. Um, so it turns out that the answer doesn't depend on actually how you oriented, orientate the, uh, the quiver. Um, so we take the e6. Uh, um, right, if we take the, if q is any orientation of this, and we take the v matrix, um, then this guy is luckily already uh, really full rank and is acyclic. Therefore, it satisfies all the conditions of the theorem. Uh, we can compute its Betty table, and it looks like this. 
So it always goes up from zero to the dimension, which is the number of vertices, uh, number of uh, rows of the B matrix, and, and the betting number is one, one, zero, one, zero, one, and on the second row there's a one. And um, what, uh, what what are the forms? So the form uh, <coughs> So, so the form here is just this gamma, so there's always a true form. There's a, always a true form that uh, is non-zero in cohomology. Um, uh, and, and in this case, it, it generates H2, and then its powers give me H. So gamma, gamma squared is here, and uh, gamma cubed is here. And this form um, in the, in the um, uh, has, a, has, a, uh, has a formula that looks like this, just to just to uh, explicitly write what it is. So it's not a D log form, and it looks like. Uh, it looks something like this in the initial cluster. Um, and the symmetry property that this, uh, that this table has is that it's symmetric uh, around this diagonal line, row by row. So it satisfies what you would expect to be the, um, you would, it satisfies some kind of concurrent duality. Um, uh, well, that's its duality, and uh, so the D-log forms have their own uh, have their own uh, will be will satisfy concurrent duality, and then the forms which are one step away from being a D-log form, they will have some kind of duality, um, and so it'll be symmetric uh, here. And then uh, another example is if I take took the E8 quiver, then the Betty table now looks like this. And the symmetry is around kind of again the middle line, but the middle line is now uh, going diagonally. So that this is uh, this is what it means for this thing called curious uh, Lapschitz duality. Is that um, these uh, Betty, these mixed Hodge tables satisfy uh, um, uh, a Lapschitz duality, which uh, is symmetric but has to be shifted depending on how far away you are from a D-long form. Okay, uh, um, let me, so we completely understand, we completely understand the first row, which means we completely understand all cohomology classes, uh, which, are, uh, which are wedges of D logs of regular functions. Um, and um, the first row, uh, um, of which star, um, under the conditions Luis and Kuba, right, um, has the whole, has the description. So, let me try to write down the, um, uh, what the, what the D-log cohomology classes look like, because I think this is, those are the classes that seem to be most interesting to people that I talk to, the who are <coughs> um, just should be kind of like like a torus, right? Uh, sorry. Like dimensional torus. Um, no. not 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 quite. I mean, this, this is not a. I mean, this is not this is not the Betty table of the torus. This is a torus. Yeah. But, uh, so what what is it? So it turns out that every D log form um, is uh, is the sub ring of H star, which is generated by by D log of a frozen variable. <coughs> so things that look like dy over y, but one for each frozen variable. And also gamma sub, but there can be more than one of these forms. You can, um, it turns out that if the quiver Q is disconnected, so if the quiver is disconnected, then each connected component will get one of these forms and it will be a, well, a regular form. Um, so, so gamma sub uh, Q I for each connected component of Q I of Q. So, well, of course, uh, the number of connected components of Q is a, is a mutation invariant. So, Anyway, for each, yeah. we get one of those forms, and we just take we just take cup products or wedges of these forms, and that would give me cohomology classes, um, uh, uh, all cohomology classes that are D logs. 
Um, so in other words, if you wanted to write an integral that and the form that you used was a d log form, then um, uh, then you can get the same integral. You can get the same integral by replacing it by something that's a polynomial in dy over y and and these uh, these symplectic forms. Um, <coughs> and in fact, <coughs> I, I said these are d log. Um, I mean, I said this is the the first row corresponds to d log of some some function. It turns out that. Um, uh, they're actually even simpler. Every uh, everything is in cohomology the same thing as something that I call standard form, uh, standard forms, uh, which is just some uh, something that in some in some particular cluster looks like this. So, can okay. lambdas are always these two forms, or they're just made out of uh, products of these two forms? Of these basic, so I didn't understand. Just in so so the, okay. So what one is saying, what one is saying is, uh, is, is the, the kind of form that you need to consider is sum over some scalars times like d y one over y one d y five over y five, um, and then you take gamma, uh, you take gamma q um, to some power. Uh, so this thing you want to... But gamma Q is the, this basic two form. Yeah, this basic two form. Right. But this two form, you can raise it to... The symplectic two form. Yeah, yeah this symplectic yeah. two form, you can raise it to higher power. Sure, sure, sure. But there's also, what I'm saying is there's more than one symplectic two form. One for each connected component, basically. So gamma Q1 to some power A1, gamma Q2 to the power A2. So if you wedge d log Y with itself, then you get nothing. So those, those ones you don't have to raise to power. But these two forms, when you raise the two powers, they, they can still be non, uh, non-zero, so you have to raise them. And so, so the kind of thing that is happening in, uh, in the top row of cohomology is this. Um, but in fact, it, it's, so what, I'm, what I want to say is that it's actually, this looks like a horrible way to write it, but actually all of them look something like this. You can pick your favorite choice of a cluster, and when you restrict the form to that cluster, it just looks like this. These are some scalars, and your form, uh, your form is just a wedge of d logs in that cluster. But uh, of course, not every such thing is, uh, uh, not every such thing um, uh, is going to be regular everywhere. So the first row of H-star has the following description. So the subring generated by d log frozen and the getman shapiro weinstein forms, and standard forms on a torus that are regular on the whole. So they have no singularities on, um, on any of the points. Regular on, on x. Um, but you can make this slightly weaker, and you can say um, standard forms. So I've got... Um, and you only need to check that it's regular on one torus and the adjacent one. Regular on, on uh, one cluster torus and all uh, adjacent ones. And also we have uh, uh, four, there. there's, a, there's a formula, there's just some explicit basis of these forms. Um, Okay, um, and uh, okay, so uh, out of time, let me let me say well, one more one more little thing is that the the, the easiest for, for this story the, the, of calculating cohomology, the easiest case uh, uh, the easiest case is when q when the quiver q is equal to a n, just the a n quiver, and then in this case everything is in the top row, uh, or of H star is, uh, is given by the previous theorem. Um, but already when we go to type D or type E, we already get some interesting, like in these examples over here, so in this type E examples, we have interesting cohomology classes that are not D log or something. Um, thank you. So, 
question about this last thing that you said about cluster and all adjacent ones. I think like one of the definitions of cluster algebras, I think in some of the later papers of Pamin Zlavinsky, maybe cluster algebra 4, or what exactly, was kind of similar to this one. So you need to take only one cluster and all adjacent ones. So and is it related to this result? Or? Um, so uh, when you so the, the way I define um, the way I define a cluster variety is x is equal to spec of a. Um, so it is necessarily an affine variety. When you glue these cluster tori together, like in this uh, uh, oh, if you want here for my three by three matrix talk, but like in like in this uh, case that we had uh, previously, where we take uh, one 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 a b c and the the cluster variety is given by the condition C is not equal to zero, and this minor is not equal to zero. Uh, a, B, minus C. So uh, that's the, th this is the cluster variety. And what happens is that there are two cluster tori, and, um, and there's one point in here that is not on either cluster torus. Um, if I remove that point, the, the um, variety is no longer affine. Um, so, uh, Affine means that I can um, I can recover the cluster variety perfectly from its ring of functions. So 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 an example so so the kind of example I have in mind maybe this is is, is if I take if I take C two and I poke a hole um, at the origin, um, uh, then any regular function outside here um, by Hartog's theorem you can. It, uh, if it's regular everywhere, it can't have a pole at co-dimension 2, so it's going to be regular on C2. So um, uh, if I take C2 minus the origin, then the ring of functions of this is the same as the ring of functions of C2. So I can't, in terms of functions, I can't tell the difference between C2 minus one point and C2. So, so what I'm saying is, my, the way I define cluster variety, and I know that not everyone does it this way, but it, the way I define cluster variety it necessarily is determined by the ring of functions. So, um, so this thing when you take a cluster torus and you glue another cluster torus and so on, that is usually missing some points, um, which you have to fill in. You have to fill in by taking the affine, affine closure. Can you say where the pole? Uh, there, uh, there's something simple I'm, I'm not understanding. So, like the uh, the top form only has poles when the frozen variables go to zero. Uh, say again. Sorry. The, the top form only has uh, the, the poles. For example, for GKN, the, the, uh, the, uh, the top form only has poles from the cyclic minor. Yep. So um, do these lower forms, do they have poles when anything other than a frozen variable goes to zero, or are they constructed not to do that? So um, they definitely have. So because I'm allowing the y over y as one of the forms, they definitely have poles when the frozen variables right. go to zero. Those are fine, um, yeah. but do they have... The, the other question de depends on how I'm compactifying the cluster variety. No, but, uh, no I mean, oh. Given, given in this situation, you have, uh, you have what, the, the y over y, you have something like j over a in some cluster. Uh, so, so this is, this, this is the... Um, because I remember you wrote something like d a over a. So in this case, the two frozen variables are c and this delta. Um, so the um, uh, the Betty table of this guy. Um, so this guy is three-dimensional. Betty table goes up to h three. Um, in degree one, it, uh, it's spanned by one. Here you can take d c over c and d delta over delta. In h two, uh, there are two things you can put here. You can take d c over c wedge d delta over delta. Or, or you can take this gamma, interesting, interesting two form. And over here, H3 is, there are two possible things. It's gamma wedge dc over c, or gamma wedge d. Uh, actually, those are equal. Oh, okay. so, so up to sign. So this is, uh, yeah, that's still one dimensional. I, I don't know if that. I don't know if this answers gamma, so, gamma has for when, when you restrict gamma to, to the point like uh, like when a and b both are zeros, then gamma has four. Uh, no, 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 it doesn't because it can't have a, it can't have. This is a three-dimensional space. You can't have a pole in just like at one point. Uh, yeah. It's a smooth three-dimensional space. It has a pole. It has a pole in four-dimensional one. 
Are you saying the question of what the poles are for the lower form? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for example, forget, forget a class of variety. You can, yeah. you can take you can take C star and and put just take the natural form of this, which is like like this thing. And if you want to ask what are the poles of this, then you have to ask how to compactify C star. I guess you could compactify it. You could put it inside P one cross P one, in which case there'll be four poles. Or you can you can put it inside P two, and and then there's so you, you can't tell if it's a square or a triangle if you just sorry c star c star square if you just give me c star square and I give you this form you can't you can't tell whether the boundary is a square or a triangle so you can't you can't count the number of poles until we've given you the boundary. I could pull back to some. Garden variety subspace of the right dimension and ask on that subspace what the poles are. That's a sensible question. That's independent of uh, how I compactify. Mm. So, not, not in this. I mean, not in this. This is the top form, so there's no. We don't have to. I, I'm just taking this two form. Oh, oh, oh on, sorry. Sorry. On C star that, squared. Okay. And I'm, I'm just saying, asking well, uh, asking how many poles it has isn't, isn't an invariant question without standardizing. <laughs> I ask because we know, well, I'll, we'll talk about it a little more tomorrow, but we have built loads of interesting forms that do not appear to be related. To uh, powers of gamma wedged a bunch of e log one. Right. Uh, yeah. So, because so yeah, I'm not because sure if I think if, if you're thinking yeah. about things like like the, the um, string amplitude case or something like M zero A, that's because that is not honestly a classic variety. No, no. Way I'm talking about things on G four M, for example, or or G G M N in general. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But I mean. Uh, okay. All right, if there are no other questions, let's uh, have a fun little talk. All right, bright and early tomorrow. Uh, what's happening for dinner? Uh, 6.30. Where? Uh, uh, well, uh, I guess it's... Um, uh, uh, those of, those of you coming, let's meet around uh, 20 minutes or so uh, in the lobby.